I was just thinking you uh, introduced me for being uh, 35 years in the mission field. Well, I was. I was in the mission field in Florida and Ohio and Maine. And sometimes we forget that <laughs> this is a mission field of uh, the greatest order. And, and, and you're part of being in this mission field. It's a really a wonderful opportunity. As uh, you were got together for, for prayer, I got thinking about <clears throat> the political confusion that is going on in this country. Just, just imagine, I, I, I got thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they all got together in a convention and they all were around holding hands in prayer. And instead of everyone giving a speech, they all prayed, oh God, show us who our leader should be. Holy Spirit, come upon that man or that woman that should be our leader. Wouldn't that be something? Because there's so much division that even when the person is selected, that won't stop it. It'll just continue and we'll do the best we can and we'll be praying for these people, but oh, how different it could be. But of course, that's, that's a dream, but the Lord will still, the Lord still, in spite of all this, will choose a person. And whoever it is, if you're a Democrat and the Republican is chosen, we have to get behind that person. If you're a Republican and a Democrat is chosen, we need to get behind that person. Uh, so that, uh, and, and somehow God will work through all this. Somehow God will work through all this and guide us just the same. I just want to say something about tonight. Uh, I'll be here at 5.30, and of course, you're all invited. And I'm going to tell my story in this book that we just published about a year or so ago called Severed. And it's a picture of my family that was severed, that was torn apart. And my my mother truly and my father truly became slaves in Siberia. You need to hear this story. One, one early morning, soldiers came to my house and at gunpoint, my parents were asked, what do you think this is gonna be more powerful? My, my parents were asked to pack in half an hour. They weren't told where they were going. And then they were taken away. And fortunately, my mother asked if I could be left behind. And I'll tell you that story in, in detail. And they permitted me to be left behind. So my aunt raised me. And she became a Seventh-day Adventist, by the way. My parents were Lutherans. And I want to tell you how during World War II, how the Lord protected us. A bullet flew over my head, just missed me. And uh, we were put into a workers' camp and by a miracle we were able to escape that workers' camp. And finally we were able to come to the United States. And uh, I, I hope you can come and listen to the story. And by the way, if you, uh, at the end of the story, it'll be about 6.30, it'll take me an hour. If any of you want to purchase this book, it'll be available for $16. And by the way, I don't have any way to take credit cards, so be sure if you're interested to bring a checkbook or the money that is appropriate. And I think you'll be inspired how God led in my life. And if you want to understand what it was like 
in cold Siberia where it got down to 50 degrees below zero and wind chill factor made it even less 60 or so below zero and living in the midst of a communist dictatorship you'll have to come and hear that story and 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 many of you may not realize but our country we were in slavery now you know I my culture is as you can see a, a Caucasian white culture but we were in slavery sometimes people forget that for 700 years under barons we were what you call serfs but it's exactly what American blacks went through and uh, fortunately we were able to win our freedom but my mother went right back into being a, a slave there in a terrible conditions of a communist empire but God saved us and you'll hear the story tonight hopefully you'll come all right When you go down into the catacombs of Rome, where Christians had their, their cemeteries, they buried each other in, inside the, the walls of the catacombs. This was, of course, you know, uh, caves that were underneath the ground in Rome. And Christians escaped there with their lives to save their lives. If you see the paintings that you find there, so many times you'll see Jonah and the big fish, which represented the resurrection of Christ to Christians. But that's about all that many people know about that story. But today we're going to investigate it closer and see what message that story has for us. If you turn with me to the book of Jonah, and let's take a moment because I'm going to stay in this book. I won't leave it. So once you're there, you'll be able to follow along. Jonah, you know, it's after Obadiah and Amos and so on, Hosea. Jonah, the first chapter, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Let me see if I can um, illustrate some of this with the slides that I have. Can you... Um, Bring up the slides here. Okay, here is the uh, picture of a map. Thank you. Jonah received this message. Let's see. Um, there's a little circle. Can you see this uh, circle from uh, where you're sitting? Can you all, can you, how many can see that? Okay, good, because it's pretty, pretty low. <laughs> but Jonah was born up here at Gath Hefer. And the circle is around the city of Joppa. So Jonah heard this message. And the Lord told him to go to that great city, that wicked city of Nineveh. And you notice that it starts with, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And most of the minor prophets start this way. The word of the Lord came to Hosea. The word of the Lord came to Micah. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah and so on through vision 
or through dreams, the word of the Lord came to these men, and it came to Jonah. And of course, as soon as Jonah saw it, he immediately followed the Lord and started going. Is that, is that what he did? No, he ran away. <laughs> he went in the opposite direction. The scripture says that he fled from the Lord. And from this city, he went something like 50, 60 miles south to Joppa. Joppa is the city where Peter saw a vision of this sheet coming down. Well, it's the same city of Joppa. And when he arrived there, he went to the, to the shore and he was looking for a ship. And he came to a ship. And by the way, let me just say this. That instead of staying where he was, instead of going on the commission, and the commission was to... Oh, j just leave that those maps up here. I'll just... Uh, okay. Instead of taking this trip, he was to go on this trip all the way up here to Carchemish and all the way to Nineveh. It was to be a trip 600 miles long. Instead of going there, he went the other way. Instead of going north, he went south. And the Bible says he went down to Joppa. That's unfortunately what takes place. We go down instead of going up in our experience. And why, why is it that people, men quite often, will not go to church, will not read the Bible, will not go where spiritual things are going on? Isn't it because they feel uncomfortable doing these things? And they want to remain as happy as they can. And so they go the opposite direction. So when Jonah got down to Joppa, the first thing he did was look for a ship that would go far away from where he was supposed to go. And just imagine with me. He saw some sailors in a ship and he asked them, where are you fellows going? Oh, the men said, we're going to Caesarea, right, a little t a town, a Tyre and Sidon, I should say, right here. Well, Jonah said, that's, that's not far enough. Then he saw another ship and, and some men, and he asked the sailors, where are you guys going? Oh, they said, we're going to go to Greece. And that would be around here. He thought to himself, that's not far enough. So there was another ship here. And he asked the sailors, where are you guys going? Oh, they said, we're going to Tarshish. Now we think that's by Spain. That's about 1,200 miles. It would be going in this direction, far over here. He thought, this is great. This is this is ordained. There's a ship that's going that far. So the Lord must be letting me go there. Just think. Sometimes that kind of thing comes to you. You see a nice ship. You, you see a great excursion trip on a cruise ship. And you say, Man, this must be it. Or you see, for a man, a beautiful girl. And you say, this must be it. Or, or for a woman, a real handsome fellow. Or you get a job offer that re offers you some real good money. You say, this is it. It must be from the Lord. And then you get on that job and you marry that girl or the guy. And you get that position and it doesn't turn out good at all. 
and you never prayed, you never asked. You simply thought, well, this would satisfy my will, and I'm going to do it. And so he decided to go. Oh, I know my hand accidentally keeps hitting this thing. All right. And so he gets on that ship to Tarshish. And he thinks he's escaping the Lord. But then there's a surprise that came to him. The Lord provided a great storm. And he forgot that the Lord, the Lord can go on, on a ship too. He can get on a plane. He can get deep into a submarine if he needs. And he found that the Lord had created a great wind, a great storm. And the mariners were afraid. And they weren't godless. They, they weren't atheists. They all prayed to their God. And they began to throw this stuff overboard. Whatever was heavy on the ship, they threw overboard. And the storm continued. And the captain finally asked someone, you know, I saw some fella get aboard this ship. Where is he? <laughs> they went down into the hold of the ship. And they saw this gentleman called Jonah. And in verse 6, the captain said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so, so we may not perish. And they decided to do something that uh, we don't do in our culture. They cast lots to decide whose fault it was. See, there's a reason why God does things, and the storm is, was brought about by the Lord. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell of all things on Jonah. And then the captain asked, please tell us, what is your occupation? Oh, Jonah said, I'm an evangelist. I'm going to make sure that this, the people of Nineveh will be saved. Is that what he said? No, he didn't say that at all. He said, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord of heaven who made the sea, and who made the dry land. And then the men, it says, were exceedingly afraid. Afraid because they discovered he himself said that he had escaped the presence of the Lord. And now they were worried. And the thing that they were worried was that they would be punished for what he did. And they prayed to the Lord. And by the way, it says they prayed to the Lord this time. L-O-R-D, capital letters. They prayed to Jehovah. He, in the talk that was going on, they became convinced that his Lord was the Lord of Lords. And they prayed to the Lord Jehovah. And they asked him what they should do. And now here's a great miracle that is taking place. To see the change of heart in a man. To see a man be converted is a tremendous miracle. And you know how hard it is for you to persuade people who are making a lot of money, who are proud to follow the Lord. And he said, throw me into the water. Cast me there. You know, there may, may have been a time in your life when you had gotten deep into sin 
and no decision was a good one. To decide to go to the right was no better than to go to the left because you were in such deep sin, such deep problems that no advice that you were getting was going to get you out of them. And the only thing you had left to do was throw your life into the hands of God and let him get you through. I've talked to men who had felt they had gone so far from God. It may have been a relationship with another woman. It may be tax evasion or something else that they thought it was absolutely hopeless and only suicide seemed to be any good answer at all. And then I've seen the same men cry out to God, Oh, God, take my life, and you guide it. Somehow, you're going to get me through. And this is what Jonah did. The, the amazing thing is, when he was down there in the hold of the ship before this, he was able to sleep through it in spite of the, the rolling of the casks and the slapping of the sails and the smashing of the spars and gear and the shout of the mariners and the howl of the gale. He was able to sleep through it. Thank God that you are troubled by your sins. Thank God that sometimes you can't sleep through the night. I mean, just imagine if you're not bothered at all and you're able to live through and on in your sins. What a problem that would be. Well, Jonah was touched. And they threw him into the water. And then a big fish came along. We don't know what kind of fish it was. I have read some stories where men have fallen into the sea and a whale or a large shark has come by and swallowed them, but they don't keep them very long. A man doesn't taste good, especially when he's in all his clothes and shoes are on, and, and they usually spit them out. On the West Coast and other places, I've heard of, just in the last number of years, a man fall into the sea, and a, a large fish is there, and it, its mouth is open. He goes in, but... He soon comes out again. And so he was swallowed by this, this fish. You might say, how is this possible? Because the digestive juices in a, in a large fish will cause a man to be blind. It'll eat, eat right a cornea of his, of his eyes. And, and really, can a man fit into the digestive tract? And, and if he did, how in the world would a man get out? It's so slippery. You, you can't get a hold of anything. You'll never get out. But look very carefully what the Bible says. Verse 17 of chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish for Jonah. If the Lord had done this, and the, and the word I looked it up, it's, you can only translate that word in Hebrew to be prepared, provided, arranged, appointed. The Lord specifically provided that fish. And, and if you look later on when he is spit out, it says the Lord spoke to the fish. Now, if the Lord is in control of the fish, he can stop the digestive juices from working so that a man can be swallowed without having the acid blind him and eat up his flesh. 
And so there he was for three days and three nights. Later, Jesus would refer to this as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we know this was a true story because Jesus compares it with the greatest event in history, his own death. And so there he was. Was the Lord able to reach him? Oh, yes. Verse uh, one of uh, verse 2 of chapter 2. I cry to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. That's, that's where a man goes. That's a death chamber. The belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. No matter what situation you may be in, God can hear your voice. And he will answer in ways... It's hard to believe. He, he, verse 9 of chapter 2, he says, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And then an amazing call came from the Lord. He was regurgitated. I wonder, let's, let's just think for a minute. How far had this ship gone? We don't know. But it started here in Joppa. And let's say it made about 50-mile journey. And then finally he was thrown into the water here. Well, if that happened and he was thrown out, what happened to it? Did, did, did his skin blanch white? Did it, was it all wrinkled when he came out? Uh, was his hair instead of black now blonde? We don't know. When he walked here, he could have, if it was around here, he could have walked to his house. It would have been about 20 miles. I wonder what his family said when they saw him. Oh my goodness, where have you been? <laughs> and then he tried to explain to them. He certainly wouldn't start the journey right then. His clothes were all probably eaten up and shrunk. and So he had to go home and get change. Did, did he get a backpack and then fill it with food? Did he, did he kill a goat and cut the leg? I mean, uh, bind the legs, uh, the four legs, and then the throat, bind it and fill it with water? I mean, that's the, the water jug that they would have in ancient times. Would he fill that up, and then, then would he would he stop start the walk? You know, it was dangerous those days to walk by yourself. This was a well-known merchant journey. If you took this and went six hundred miles, you could go here, and and here would be the country that you all know about these days, Afghanistan, the mountains of Afghanistan, and you could go all the way to India on that journey. I mean, there were merchants of all kinds, and, and there were thieves along the way too. Would you walk all that? If you went 10 miles a day, it would take you 60 days, two months. I have a sneaking suspicion that what Jonah did, he found the other merchants with camels taking that journey, and probably some merchants would be Jews. They've always been great traders. Surely they were back, but great traders, great uh, trader then. And he probably got a ride with them. He certainly would want to keep the Sabbath. So he'd want to find some Jewish merchants. And if they went by camel and they went twice the speed, it might be a little less than 60 days. But I know historically that if you started from Nineveh and you went all the way to Egypt, if you, you know, Israel, as you know, was in the center of a great trading route. That's why 
God gave them Israel so they would be witnesses to his truths to the whole world. Oh, they disappointed our Lord because they, they actually rejected him instead of becoming a witness. But so, so if he went on this route, Let's say it was 45 days. We don't know. And he went up here to Carchemish and Haran and finally arriving in Nineveh. Now, I want to remind you that Nineveh was a wicked empire. That's why he didn't want to go there. Ashurbanipal, for example, was one of the warlords that operated during Jonah's day, 800 BC. Let me describe to you what Ashurbanipal did to his enemies once he won a battle. Their men, young and old, I took prisoners. Of some, I cut off their feet and hands. Others I cut off their ears and lips. Of the young men's ears I made a heap. Of the old men's a minaret. I exposed their heads in front of the city. Children I burned. I gouged their eyes. Hung their heads on trees. Their skin I flailed. They actually sliced their skin off. It was terrible. When I was studying this, an interesting thing came to my mind. This is the Euphrates River that flows through Babylon. This is the Tigris River that goes to Nineveh. Now the Tigris River comes up right here. Nineveh is on the right side and the city of Mosul is on the left. Now, as you've been hearing about ISIS, ISIS took possession of Mosul, the second largest city in a much other territory in Iraq. Mosul was a Christian city. 60,000 Christians were there through the decades. But when ISIS came and took control. June 10, 2014, all the Christians fled and they're gone. And what is happening in Mosul, right next to Nineveh right here? Well, if, if you rob someone, you're punished by having your hand amputated. If you commit adultery, they put you in a high building and throw you off and everyone has to watch you do that. Children are taught to put on explosive jackets and some children are, have these jackets put on and as father watches and as this is videoed, the son will explode himself because they've taught him this is the thing to do. He may get 70 virgins as a prize, but more than likely, he'll be terribly disappointed because the person we would like to meet when we die is to meet Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that right? Uh, fortunately, I'm married and I'm not looking forward to another woman. <laughs> but really, th this is, it's, it's the, the, uh, the terrible misconceptions that they have taught. And this is now right next to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh right here, was destroyed in 612 B.C. 
It was destroyed by the Babylonians and the Medes that got together and because of the vicious way they treated people, the, the Assyrians treated people, the Babylonians and Medes were so angry, they got together and absolutely destroyed Nineveh so that the king himself and all his retinue were burned up and they were in the middle of the fire when Nineveh was destroyed. You want to take a, a trip with me to Nineveh? Let me show it to you. This is it. Not very exciting. Because they totally destroyed it. And all you have left is this wall. And this is the amazing thing. It wasn't until 2,500 years later, in 1865, that the archaeologist Laird came by and confirmed that the mounds that we have just seen, and they dug into these mounds, he confirmed that this truly was Nineveh. But the same city was, once again, let me remind you, it was destroyed 612 B.C. 200 years later, 400 B.C. 200 years after Nineveh was destroyed, Xenophon, the Greek general, with 10,000 men passed this city. And he asked his soldiers, what city was it? And nobody knew what city it was. It was destroyed so thoroughly. It's like 200 years from now, if I could live 200 years, and I would come by the city of Orlando, and ask you, what city was that? And none of you would know it. That's how badly it was destroyed. So if Jonah had not come at, two, at six, uh, 200 years before 612, which was 800 B.C., then all these people would not have heard the warning message. They would have listened. It is for us the, the time to tell it. this message is now, isn't it? And so, as I mentioned, the archaeologist Laird came by and he confirmed this was in about 2,500 years that they, they had... They had uh, looked at three other places that they thought was Nineveh, but finally they decided on the right place. Let me show you something else. In Mosul, you have this monument. To, it, it's a tomb to Jonah. Now, we're not sure whether Jonah was actually buried here, but this was the traditional site. The Christian Assyrian Church built this monument in the 14th century and it stood through the years until Isis and this is in the city of Mosul right next to Nineveh and when the Isis conquerors came in they put explosives on that tomb and by the way the Muslims believe in Jonah too so, so that shows you that ISIS is more conservative and rougher uh, uh, than, than even uh, the, um, the Muslims who... It's a, it's a very strict belief of the Muslims. And on July 27, 2014, they blew it up. Now there 
idea is if we can destroy all of history, of course they can't, but if we could, then we could teach anything we want and there'd be no opposition. That's like having all the Bibles and all the evidence of the Reformation destroyed. That's their concept. Wickedness is wickedness no matter if, it, if, they, if people believe in Ishtar as the Assyrians did or to believe in the God that they worship there today called Allah. It's the same kind of wickedness. Now, imagine with me that you arrive, this is a picture of the, what it could have, what Nineveh could have looked like. Here you have the temple of Ishtar that they worshipped and sacrificed to. Here's the library of Ashurbanipal. And now I'm going to show you something that is pretty interesting. The wall that Jonah had to go through was quite a thick wall. If I started measuring the wall from here to the front of the church. Let me start measuring it just a little bit. I have this instrument. I can start here, and I'm going to roll it and measure the distance from the back of the church. If I go to approximately the, the middle, I, it's 19 feet. How thick do you think the uh, wall was? Was was it about this thick, or would it be about twice as much? Okay, I'm going to now tell you the wall was 49 feet. And my question is, how far do you think I'm at this point? Just guessing. What is uh, 36? It's uh, 33 feet. So if I go up to here, it's 47. So if I go a little more, the wall was the wall was from the back of this church to this spot right here. That's the width of the wall. It was about 20 feet high, so you got to go a little less than twice as high. You could park eight automobiles side by side from here to the back of the church. That's a pretty thick wall, isn't it? So when, when Jonah came to this wall, and, and the wall is right here, this wall right here, he had to get through that wall. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were openings, but there were also guards there. Uh, I wonder what he, what he told them. Did he tell them, I've come here so that all of you would repent from your sins? I think they let them through. I don't know what he told them. But somehow, he went through that wall. And when he did, he gave them the message, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose, he went to Nineveh, and it said... It was a three-day journey. It probably meant that to go through the, all the cities um, back and forth, it, would, it took them three days. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown.
Now, an amazing thing. He went through the great metropolis. He spoke to the beggars and the lepers, the traders and the merchants, the soldiers and the generals and the ladies and the princesses and the priests with their bloody rights. He went to every one of them. And it says, the people of Nineveh believed and proclaimed a fast. Even the animals were put in sackcloth and ashes. Do you think that... Uh, evangelistic series of 120,000 people baptized in one day. Think I would have made the news? This is the greatest evangelistic series this earth has ever seen. If Jonah hadn't done it, 612, he was there about 800 B.C. 200 years later, 612 the city was completely destroyed. So that means that 120,000 people would all have been lost if it wasn't for the fact that Jonah got through that wall and he went to every person he could listen to and they were sympathetic and they repented. Now an amazing thing is happening today. And by the way, let me just give you this quote from Matthew 12, 41. Jesus said, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. He's talking about his generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, what did he say? A greater than Jonah is here. A greater than Jonah is with us today. Had Jonah not done this, the people wouldn't repent it. Unfortunately, the repentance didn't last forever because the wickedness came back and they needed to be destroyed and Babylon and the Medes came and did that. Now, an amazing thing is happening. You're reading in the newspapers, there are literally millions of people that are escaping Syria, Iraq, and other countries, some from Egypt and so on. As of 2014, three million people have escaped and gone to Europe. A few have gotten to, to America and to other places in the world. About a million have come this past year, 2015. And we're seeing a possibility of the greatest evangelistic opportunity this earth has seen in a long time. Because when they come to Europe, and by the way, some of our politicians are taking a strong stand not to have any Muslim come to America. I hope they change their minds because this is not the basic character. I came as a refugee, and you'll hear that story tonight. But those people that come will be able to come to a free Europe or to a free America or free Sweden, Switzerland, you name the countries. And I know it's a burden on these countries. It won't be much of a burden to accept 20,000 is what some people are talking about. But if, if more come, they will come and they may hear the gospel a little garbled up, you know. Some denominations won't have it quite straight. <laughs> but they'll have the freedom to examine the Bible. And, you know, if, if you're in Egypt, for example, I, I travel to Egypt. If you convert a person from being a Muslim to a Christian, you'll be put in jail. And they, they will be, who knows, their lives may be taken. It's not that easy. There are many secret Christians. And, and the best plan we have had, I've read in the Review and Herald, 
is if some families, such as some families from this congregation, should move to, let's say, Egypt, Iraq, or, or Syria, and then work with the people in your neighborhood, we, might, we could reach a few people that way. But how many will there be in such a slow process? In AD 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed, Jesus told them if they would flee the city, when they saw the sign of the Roman armies backing off, they could escape the city before the Roman armies would come back for the final slaughter. And that's what they did. The Christians went from Jerusalem to the many parts of the then known world to spread the gospel message. But this time, they're going to come to us in a way we never thought. We, how are we ever going to reach the Muslims? We have wondered. This is an opportunity that is coming. And I hope that we take it. I hope those in, in power, and I hope the politicians give up their idea of discrimination against a certain people just because they're Muslim and open up their hearts because God loves Muslims too, doesn't he? Just like he loved us. And so let us pray that we take this opportunity and when some of these folk, and of course, when many others too, because I think you're convinced as I am, as you see the drop in morality, and even amongst our leaders, the language we're hearing is just awful. And the conditions in morality that we're seeing and of course, the, th the other thing, the wars and the floods and the tornadoes. We're seeing tornadoes. We shouldn't be seeing tornadoes in December, in January, like we're seeing. Things are being turned upside down. And I think these are the signs that Jesus is coming. And I know many of you feel, such as Bonnie and I, that there's nothing really great to look forward to except the coming of Jesus. And may the Lord help you as you prepare for that day. As for our closing prayer, dear Father, we thank you for the word we've heard today. We thank you, Lord, that you have Open our eyes to see once more your calling. Lord, let us not be as Jonas when you call us to do your work and your will. Let us not put ourselves first. Let us hear and honor your word, Father, and follow and obey. Bless the service today and help us as we go our different ways now that we will come back this afternoon to hear even more, Father. Keep us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.